So what you're seeing here um, is a printout. And uh, the way I work and uh, worked was that I was um, sent the text and I went down to Kinko's and I blew it up until it was the right size to fit the piece of wood. And then I brought it home and I taped it on the piece of wood. You can see the tape at the top of the piece of paper there. And I put the carbon paper underneath it. And that's how I was transferring the script to the wood. And a very curious thing happened. Um, so I was using an ordinary plain blue ballpoint pen um, to go over the Balinese script and transfer it through the carbon paper onto the wood. And I was part of the way through this and the sun um, appeared between uh, two buildings. Um, it had been, I was living in a house that was right next to the other one, so the place had been in shadow. And suddenly the sun came streaming in and reflected off the work that I was doing. And through some strange uh, magic of chemistry or physics, the blue ballpoint turned gold. And as I looked at this, I was just um, struck. Uh, um, I was marveling at how extraordinarily beautiful these letters were in gold. Um, it had never, I had never done any painting of gold or use of gold leaf in, in the carvings I had done. It was always black. And the, uh, I was hit by a series of, of, of thoughts, one after another. The first was that this had become an illuminated manuscript. And I had always thought of the word illuminated in the phrase illuminated manuscript to mean something like decorated. But especially given that, you know, many Western illuminated manuscripts were, of course, sacred text or religious texts, it, I suddenly realized that this was actually a medium of illumination. It was a way of illuminating the reader. And in particular, it was a way of using writing to illuminate the reader. Um, I was also struck by the fact that the gold letters had a kind of a soft edge compared to the letters that have been were black or in, in, uh, in ballpoint. And uh, it then occurred to me that if a, if a letter is black, it's defined by its edge. And you can tell that by the fact that we look for more and more precise instruments for creating letters, maybe so that we can blow them up. So now we use lasers, in fact, um, because we really want as crisp an edge as possible. But a gold letter is defined by its heart. Um, the brightest part of the letter is not at the edge, but right in the middle where you have the greatest reflectivity. Um, and I thought, you know, there is something here, um, something that I, I really want to kind of put my finger on if I can. Um, it also struck me that by going from black to gold, the letter had somehow gone from solid to liquid. Um, and I began to think more and more about the relationship between the writer and the reader through the written word. We're going to come back to this um, in greater detail in the, um, in the Zoom talk that I'm doing about Mandaic. Um, but this was the first time when I started thinking um, there is something about meaning. There is something about meaning and intention and illumination that means that writing is not always simply a functional transaction, nor is it simply just a means of representing the sounds of words that you wish to pass on to somebody else. And as I said in my last talk, we, by being the dominant culture and by having an alphabet that is the world's dominant alphabet, and by using writing every day for every purpose, we've sort of lost track of what else writing might be. It's hard to conceive of it in any other way. 
And in fact, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, um, it would be easy to dismiss as being superstition, for example. But I'm going to argue that that's because our own use of writing has narrowed our perceptions to the point where we have reduced it to a functional minimum and we're unaccustomed to thinking about it in any other way. So with that in mind, I'm going to move on to the next um, carving that I did in, um, in Balinese. So this, um, this really beautiful glyph here, it really has no counterpart in our culture or our language or our writing. It's called a pomada. And I carved it not that long after that first exhibition, just because I had seen it on Omniglot, which at the time was my principal source of information, had everything. And uh, so the pomada has a purpose that, as I say, really lies beyond our experience in writing. Its job is to indicate that the text that follows is a sacred text. And even back in 2011, 2012, when I was doing this, I, I thought, well, now that's a really interesting notion because it implies that we should read it in a different way. We should read it with a different kind of attention. We should read it with a different kind of open heartedness. Um, it's really saying something like pay greater respect in the same way that you take off your shoes when you're coming indoors. Um, it's saying pay greater attention. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary notion. Um, but I really had uh, no clear sense of how this was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and uh, then in the course of doing my research, I was reading through um, the most beautiful book I own, which is the book Illuminations, the Writing Traditions of Indonesia, which um, is just an extraordinary book. Um, and I came across the section on uh, Balinese writing. And I should say that some of the things that it says about Balinese are also true of other Indonesian languages and um, scripts, and probably also true of other scripts elsewhere. Um, I don't know, I haven't done that much research, but let's have a look at some of this. So here's the point. Many cultures believe that writing has a divine origin because it can be used for this purpose of illumination. And so here's a quote from uh, Rachel Rubinstein's essay in the book Illuminations. Belief in the divine origin and the supernatural potency of writing has also produced a web of rituals that surround literate activity in, in, in Bali, she's talking about, including writing, reading, discarding lontar texts. So lontar is the palm leaf. Well, I'll show you a lontar in a minute. Storing lontar texts and paying homage to the goddess Saraswati, the patroness of literature, knowledge, and eloquence. And so you're thinking, like, so what does this mean, paying homage to Saraswati while you're doing literate activity? Um, and we will see. So this is, in fact, a lontar manuscript. As you can see, um, it's a series of thin panels. Um, made of the lontar palm that are, are perforated and held together and then bound in sort of a bookend of uh, thin slats of wood. And um, so when we talk about lontar manuscript, we're talking about something like this. What is totally astonishing um, to somebody from uh, Western culture is that the act of writing itself and the act of reading should be part of the entire sacred exchange with each other and with the infinite. And let's see what that means. So amongst the rituals that were carried out um, traditionally by scribes in Bali, and as, as I say, quite likely elsewhere, were the recitations of mantras 
not only to protect oneself, but to ask for guidance and to make sure one, one's heart was focused on the right things. And that's a really interesting idea when it comes to writing. Anyway, so mantra must be recited when carrying out the following activities, writing, requesting a boon to write, crossing out consonants, this must first be recited over the tip of the stylus, crossing out vowels, the mute symbol and numbers, opening exalted writings, reading, closing and storing lontar, absorbing knowledge quickly, burning lontar. Damaged lontar cannot just be, must be thrown away, but must be cremated like the human body. That is an amazing notion. And adorning consonants with vowels. Failing to recite these mantra is said to result in dire consequences. A short lifespan results should the letter named Setek be crossed out. Blindness and headache are the consequences of crossing out the letter Hulu, Hulu meaning head. Lameness arises should the letter Suku, foot or leg be crossed out. Deafness and stomach ailments follow the crossing out of the letter Talang, because Talang means here. So straight away, you're, you're, the temptation is to think, oh, this is mere superstition. But if you think about the idea of taking your job seriously as a writer. And even if you're thinking about the 21st century and the West, and you're imagining, okay, I'm a serious writer. I am trying to bring the best of myself to the page and then to offer that to other people. When you think in those terms, then the notion of wanting to be hyper aware before you write or before you delete becomes a really interesting one. So a friend of mine um, was a poet and a short story writer. And as soon as PCs came out, he got one of the first because he'd always wanted to write a novel. And so we sat down and he typed away and um, he finished his novel in, in six months and he sent it to his publisher and his publisher said, David, come down to, to Boston. So um, my friend David Huddle went down to Boston and David Gadeen, the publisher, took him out on a rowboat and a lake and said to him, now we're in the middle of this lake, miles from, a long way from the shore. I wanted to talk to you about your novel. I want you not only, I'm not only am I not going to publish it, I don't want you to send it to anybody else to publish it either, because you have not brought your best to the page. The PC has given you the glibness necessary to lose sight of what is really valuable and what it is that you have to offer. Um, and um, in a way, that's exactly what is going on here. The next thing is that if you're gonna regard the act of writing with such a high intent and seriousness, then you also need to regard the products of writing, namely books, um, with the same sense of high purpose and seriousness. So Lontar, so this is their equivalent of the book, the manuscript, need to be stored in wooden chests, woven baskets or cupboards, which in turn need to be in a sacred space within the house, according to the principles of geomancy. We still have a tiny vestige of this. We still look at a, a fine bookcase full of books as being an item of furniture, as being something that is more than just a decoration um, or, or just a receptacle for books. There's a sense that there is something there of value that we've brought into our house and we want to, uh, to put it on display and, and treat it with respect. And continuing from the previous slide, on the day dedicated to the goddess Saraswati, which takes place once every 210 day year, the entire day is scripted by ritual. So we do not have a national day when we respect books and writing and knowledge. Uh, we have lost this. During that day, nothing written may be destroyed or even a letter crossed out for fear of punishment by the goddess Durga and malevolent spirits. All the lontar in a household are gathered and act as the representation of the goddess to whom 18 offerings, that's Saraswati, of 
to whom 18 offerings are made, one for each of the letters in the Balinese alphabet. Each offering contains the symbol of the Supreme God made of fried rice dough. So if there is ever um, a sign of a culture that respects writing and knowledge and learning, then devoting a day to taking down and dusting off and cleaning and venerating knowledge is surely it. And of course, we really have lost that. Just to give a sense of how, again, we feel the vestiges of this. Um, some of you may have been in a position where you have written a book. Um, and if so, I congratulate you. If you've ever seen that book on a remainder table, or you've seen someone like toss it aside or um, uh, treat it disrespectfully, you know that that's an injury to you. You know that you have done your best to draw out, as I say, the best of what you have inside you and offer it as an offering. So again, the notion of a Lontar manuscript being a form of offering that is kept in a sacred place really just respects the act of writing and it respects the act of reading. We all complain that people don't read enough these days, that everything is too quick, etc. This is also a way of respecting the act of reading. And I'm really interested in this notion of writing as a manifestation of spirit. Um, so uh, Shakespeare's Theseus, Theseus, Midsummer Night's Dream, um, joking, he says, um, lunatics, lovers, and poets, um, I think he says, are of um, imagination all compact. He says, that poets give to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. So it's this movement from thought to writing and substance, to give to reifying it. Likewise, William Collins in Ode on the Poetical Character, he's talking to, about God, he who called with thought to birth yon tented sky, this laughing earth. So the act of divine creation of the, the universe, the earth, etc., is an act of thought, of moving something that is um, immaterial, invisible, and making it material and visible. And writing is not that dissimilar. So I say the precipitation of spirit into the visibility and three-dimensional reality of flesh or of the material world is not unlike the precipitation of thought into symbols on the page. Um, so that's really the, the nugget of my, um, my takeaway from the Balinese script and one of the reasons why I love it and I love that tra tra tradition so much is that it really encourages us to think of writing in a much broader and richer and deeper sense. And um, I have one other thought, which is somewhat different, um, but sort of similar. Um, so this is the last slide. This is a carving that I did um, of the, the chant, um, Om and Shanti, Shanti and Om. Um, you all remember, recognize that as a chant and it's done on a piece of wood that is called Pau Rosa or, or Red Heart. And one of the things that struck me as I did this is that a chant is a way of bringing control into one's life and into the universe. It's a way of controlling our breathing and it's a way of controlling our focus. And it's also a pattern. It's a pattern that is repeated. And writing is also a pattern. We recognize individual letters. We recognize the patterns of le certain letter combinations. And um, it's a sign that as humans, we are pattern seeking and pattern making creatures. 
And so when you look at this piece of wood here, the wood itself has not exactly a pattern, but it's got a kind of um, feeling or a kind of rhythm to it. And in that sense, it seems to me that both the chant and the act of writing are a way of dealing with the unpredictability of the universe. What we're trying to do is to bring a sense of order that we have created, the chant or the shapes of the letters, the pattern we've created, um, and helping ourselves to use that to bring this degree of um, calm and predictability and stability in an unstable world. And just today, I was sent an article from a piece of research um, just came out of Ohio State. And it turns out that here I am glibly saying, you know, we are pattern seeking and pattern making creatures and writing as a form of pattern. And frankly, I'm making this stuff up. This is, you know, I'm an essayist. I come up with ideas and I throw them out there and I see what happens. But it turns out there is an area in the brain closely linked to the language centers, which actually specifically recognizes the shapes of writing. It is activated by, by the people, even as young as three and four years old, seeing writing. So somehow um, in the past 4,000 years, we have incorporated writing as a patterning function and as part of our understanding of language to such a degree we actually have an area of the brain that um, is specialized in uh, recognizing it and manipulating it. Um, so uh, that's me throwing a ton of ideas at you. Um, I as always have gone longer than I thought I was going to. Um, I would uh, love to hear um, questions, answers, comments, thoughts. Um, they could be in chat. You could use the hand up function um, in uh, uh, your Zoom. Um, before we do that, I wanna say one last thing, which is that typically at the um, funding, and I say, you know, boy, it'd be lovely if you would consider funding this um, Zoom series and here's the link to go and do so. And you can do so, that'd be great. Um, the link will in fact be shown later on. But what I would really like you to do is to hang on for the time being because right after election day, we're gonna be starting a Kickstarter campaign to fund our biggest and most ambitious project ever which is to help the Mongolian people who are under um, threat from the Chinese government um, to um, introduce uh, Chinese rather than Mongolian into schools in um, Inner Mongolia, in the province and in China. Um, that is an act of cultural genocide, which the Mongols are perfectly aware of. And their script and their language are absolutely at the heart of their sense of their own history and their nation as a culture, as is true of all endangered alphabets. This is happening right now on a massive scale. And we have a big campaign to, to respond to that. So I'm hoping that um, you'll watch out for that. I'll be telling you more about it. I hope you support that when we come to it. That's after election day. Right now it's Q&A. I would love to hear thoughts that you have or questions that you have, or even insults and corrections and stuff like that. We do have two hands up. Uh, hopefully they're not going to insult you. <laughs> okay, who have we got? Hi, Tim. Hey, how are you? I'm good, Tim. Uh, Mihai Bledia. I'm a linguist, but I'm, I'm mainly passionate about um, endangered species. I'm, I'm Romanian, you know, born in Romania. <coughs> Excuse me. It's something interesting that you said about patterns. It's actually, is this something that you, you've been observing, like 
for each type of, you know, I don't even know how to call it, like linguistic, you know, category? Or is this something that developed probably, I don't know, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, but currently, if you were to have another language, right, whatever that language would be, you wouldn't necessarily observe patterns, but probably something else, you know, in the way that the languages are developed. And, and, and when you say patterns, in, in other words, when I look at, at that last photo that you put, mm -hmm. I do see like almost like a sequence of, you know, symbols, characters that kind of repeat themselves. Is that what you mean by pattern? And if so, how exactly, you know, do you think that they were able to even um, build something like that, you know, to make something like that from scratch? Like, what exactly did those symbols represent to them so important that they would make them in a certain way, right, in a certain mindset, for lack of a better term, that eventually became a pattern? Okay, great. So there are, I think, 19 questions in what you just asked me. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle a couple of them. Um, so one of the, th the projects that um, Alec, who is uh, co-producing this with me and I are working on right now, is a book of uh, word search puzzles in endangered alphabets. And these are all rare minority scripts that most people who open the book will never have seen before. Another project I'm working on is a book of Sudoku, which instead of using numbers, use characters from, from rare or minority writing systems. And the Sudoku and the word searches themselves are not particularly hard. What is fascinating is they are much harder when they're symbols that you don't recognize because we become so good at recognizing the symbols that are used um, every day in our lives that we not only recognize letters really quickly, but we also recognize letter clusters and letter sequences. We recognize when letters are out of sequence. We start dealing in larger units. Um, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why I'm so interested in games, because when we're children, we play all kinds of games to develop the mental facility of manipulating and moving and recognizing those shapes um, quickly. If we had to actually recognize each shape and sound it out when we read, we would never read. It would be such a laborious process. So. Uh -huh about pattern, I'm talking about um, developing individual symbols that are that have and um, learning to recognize those symbols and then patterns of those symbols. Um, typically, in answer to your other point, those are not usually invented from scratch, although a hundred writing systems at least have been invented from scratch in the last century that I know of. Um, so there uh -huh. are more. Um, and one of the things that the inventors of those scripts would have been thinking about all the time is how can I come up with symbols that are simple and clear and easily learnable and easily recognizable so that that whole process of pattern recognition does not take a lifetime, but it's something that kids can learn quickly. Sure, um, but without wanting to interrupt you, Tim, yeah, you also said about the patterns that they weren't necessarily patterns, meaning they weren't just trying to say something, but they also had like a more deeper, a more, you know, meaningful, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, um, sense, if you will. So, in other words, if, if that is true, then how come that only these patterns, you know, eventually remain in the in the language itself, right? Yeah. And not other patterns, because, you know, as limited or as developed as they may have been, something made them decide, again, for lack of a better term, to say, these are the, right, these are the patterns slash symbols that we're going to keep in a Sanskrit language. Again, it's an example. And we're not going to incorporate uh, anything else, although we might have something meaningful that we would like to communicate, but that's not necessarily going to be part of this language, right, which is probably, you know, 
in danger, extinct, whatever, however you want to think of that. Right. So in fact, there are a series of elements that make writing deeply, deeply important and connected to the culture that uses that writing. One of them is that the writing has been developed by the technologies, the writing technologies and the writing um, surfaces and media that are familiar. So in the Philippines, bamboo tubes, inscribing on bamboo tubes, you see that it's, it, it connects you literally with the climate and vegetation that you know. Secondly, um, there are there is actually a sense in which uh, cultural values of beauty are um, immersed in writing that we think of as being right or beautiful or suitable or whatever. Um, and um, in some case, in a lot of cases, there are also highly um, uh, technical reasons for the development. So copper plate script was taught in London, for example, um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, especially to uh, clerks because they had no typewriters, they wanted to eliminate mistakes. And one of the crucial elements in the development of that particular really clear form of writing was map making, because if the maps are written in writing that is at all ambiguous, the ship could mm -hmm. down, you know. So all of these features feed into um, the sense of shared history and appeal of a particular script to a particular culture. Last but not least, do you see them as these patterns and symbols uh, either together or separately? And the fact that obviously they have to come to, they must have come to a point that they said, okay, these are all the symbols. This, this is gonna be the alphabet, you know, whatever that means, where, you know, either a, a certain number of characters slash symbols or, um, meaningful things that are happening in our life right in our in our society do you see this as limitations to the specific culture or do you see them as this is the best we could come up with and you know we're not going to think about more patterns because then you know we're going to reinvent the wheel over and over and over and it's not going to be something uh, you know yes. like a finished product how do you see this so um it's a moving target so the, the, the greatest, uh, the greatest, uh, the most rapidly growing element in the Unicode standard right now is in emojis. And what my theory is that writing as we know it in the West has become so abstract and so uh, black and white, so to speak, that and the graphic impulse and creating ideograms and pictograms um, is actually a way of um, uh, bringing- Expressing ourselves in a more modern way, probably, right? In, in a 21st century. In a more ancient way, because mm -hmm. in, in many respects, what we're doing is we're just bringing back the things that had been banished as being childish. So interestingly enough, there was a, a, a right-wing commentator about a week ago who tweeted that grown men should not use emojis. They were only for women and children, which means, as I translate that, apart from that, the guy is an idiot, um, that they are ways of trafficking with emotion in a way in which writing in black and white, typing, whatever, um, is not. And I, that's exactly why there's such a growth in that area, because our form of writing has um, banished the doodle and the emoji and the decoration, and we're now finding a way to bring it back in again. Okay, who else had their hand up? Alec, you Thank said- Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Edmundo? Edmundo! Uh, yes, yes. So uh, it's been a while. Yes. Thank you very much. And yes. nice to you as well. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's finally great to see you sort of live because I think we've interfaced at some points before uh, on various sites. 
so just a couple of comments. So the first thing was about uh, the uh, feast day of Saraswati. So the other thing that I think you left out was that uh, on that day, traditionally, traditionally, uh, people are not supposed to read anything. So that's that's sort of like another element in sort of like uh, like uh, uh, honoring the text exactly. as as a phenomenon, as a cultural product, and uh, it should be respected for what it is. So that's the first thing. Uh, second it thing. It also brings an element of focus because by reading something new, you're kind of distracting yourself. And right. Okay, that's that's great detail. Okay, yes. What's the second one? Uh, the second one is uh, I don't know because th these people have just appeared in Bali, and, and I haven't been to Bali in about a year, and I'm I'm hoping to go back, you know, sometime after this whole thing blows over. Uh, but um, they are in the business of uh, selling paraphernalia for lontar. Uh, like montar making. And I wonder if anybody's heard of this. Uh, so, and I've just befriended them and I'm going to put the link up into the chat on their, for their Facebook uh, site. Great. And I, I know that there are people who are just beginning to start running long time making workshops again. Because mm. there's a skill, traditional skill that had, you know, was kind of seriously in decline. Right. And so this particular uh, company or this particular shop is, I believe, in Denpasar, the, the major urban center there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are called the Widyaksara. OK, great. So that's in chat for anyone who wants to have a look at it. Yeah, and uh, basically the owner, like uh, I, uh, I've just like chatted with her like a couple of times. Now the the one thing uh, for any of our let's say foreign audience is that because the uh, the inscribing implements are considered weapons, they cannot ship those overseas, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the stylus. Um, but uh, as soon as, you know, as soon as like it, the borders are sort of open again, I'm just going to go over there, spend some time uh, with those folks and try to try my hand at uh, That's Montar driving. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Charles? Yes. My question was, have you ever seen a bibliographic record from a library catalog that contains the Balinese script? You are a million times the bibliographer and librarian that I am. So no, I haven't. Why? I think I have one for you. Whoa. Dropped it into chat. Okay. Wonderful. You might not be able to see the font right away, but if you load the font locally on your machine, it will show up. Got it. Thanks. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I was afraid uh, a little bit because uh, your work is uh, so hard, very hard. I find it very interesting. Uh, my question uh, has to do with the relationship between the shapes of the alphabet, the letters, and the objects in the real world. Uh, for example, we have third in English, oiseau in French, in Balinese, uh, I don't know a bird what it is. Uh, so uh, in every language, the letters change. So, uh, is uh, does this uh, change of letters the shapes uh, uh, has effect have effect and an impact on uh, the concept of the the object in the real world for the people who who speak the this language or that language? Thank you so much.
Thank you. Um, so um, as I was saying in my last talk about Cherokee, one of the things that has really consciously happened um, in the West is a movement away from that kind of uh, visual representation, which was thought to be uh, primitive and childish, and that um, only in a set of purely abstract symbols that had no relation to the real world were you capable of ab abstract thought. This is an extraordinarily stupid notion, and it is um, highlighted, the stupidity is highlighted by, for example, um, a script that was invented um, for the Wan Cho um, language, uh, which is um, Arunachal um, Pradesh up in the, um, by the Himalayas in Northeast India. So this script was created quite recently by uh, a school teacher called Banwang Lo Su. And what he did was to say this really blindingly sensible thing, which is if you're going to create a script for your language, you want it to be learnable. You want kids to be able to learn it easily and quickly. And so what he did was kind of the next step beyond the, simple, the, the little signs that we see up on, on kindergarten walls, right? So we see, we see the big A, the little A, there's a picture of an apple and it says apple. And the idea is that you, see, you associate the A and the sound A ah with, with apple and you learn it more quickly. Except that the A doesn't look anything like an apple and the B doesn't look anything like a, I don't know, a bear or whatever the, the thing is. Wouldn't it be great if they did? And so in his script, each of the letters that he invented is based on the shape of um, a noun, a well-known um, visual symbol that the kids would know. So for example, you know the bird, the hornbill, right? So the hornbill has a very distinctive beak and so I don't remember what the name, what the word for hornbill is in their language, but whatever the first letter is in their word for hornbill, he had that letter look like the beak of the hornbill. And so um, you have therefore an alphabetic script, but the letters all have a kind of um, a visual mnemonic built into them. And that just strikes me as being totally sensible. That's not the only relatively recently invented script to do that. It's just the one that I happen to know most about. Um, but yes, like, wouldn't everything be much easier if everybody did that? Okay, we need to wrap up. It is um, way late here. I so appreciate your coming along and paying attention and asking great questions and giving great information and putting links into chat. Um, I will take stuff um, out of chat and send it to all of you in my follow-up email um, in which I'll also give the link where um, the recording of this um, session is uh, posted and also the link to the next talk, which will be on Wednesday at one o'clock. Um, hope you can make it. Um, thanks again for, for coming along and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.